Thanks so much, uh, Tal, for that introduction and uh, talking a little bit about our very friendly rivalry. It's not much of a rivalry given the fact that we've been uh, getting beat pretty bad here the last few years uh, at Auburn when we faced the Crimson Tide. Uh, but it is a pleasure to be with you on this afternoon. Good to see all of you here. Uh, very appreciative to uh, Tal for initially uh, extending the invitation to me to come and share uh, with each of you. I know that we have um, so many things that we could be doing, so I do count it a privilege uh, and honor that you came out this afternoon uh, to talk about these uh, important issues. I think that these are issues uh, that certainly matter. Uh, just as we're getting started here, just a quick question for you. How many of you have walked with someone um, whom you love, someone who's very close to you, maybe a family member or a friend, uh, at the end of life, at the final stages of life? You've been right there. Yeah, this touches us in some very important ways. And uh, so I hope that as we get into this that uh, we'll leave enough time for us to, to dialogue and have some conversations about uh, some of these very important matters here. Just as we're getting started here, one of my colleagues in one of his written material tells a little bit of a, sto a story of uh, this plane that was flying along and everything was going uh, fine for some time. And the pilot gets over the intercom and says, I have some good news and I have some bad news. Right? It's not the kind of thing you want to hear uh, when you're on an airplane. And so one of the passengers stops, the flight attendant went, leans down and says, uh, can you tell me what the uh, bad news is? The flight attendant paused for a moment, went back up front, got the information, came back. She says, well, the pilot informed us that the GPS is down, the computers are shut down, and that we don't know where we're going, we're actually lost in midair. Then he said, well, what could possibly be the good news? She responded by saying, but we're making excellent time. <laughs> Think about that. <clears throat> Make an excellent time, perhaps, with no idea where you're going. When it comes to issues of medical technology in many ways, I think that with these kinds of advances are coming more and more things that we can do but we haven't paused long enough to ask the questions, what, should we, uh, what ought we to do or what should we do? We're using particular kinds of treatments at the end of life and perhaps we need to ask ourselves, what were these treatments originally designed for? Uh, perhaps we've lost sight of a purpose or a telos behind the very notion of medicine. A few objectives that I have for us uh, this afternoon here is just first I want to identify three schools of thought concerning the value of human life. Second, uh, to appreciate the theological underpinnings of the sanctity of life doctrine and what that actually entails. And then lastly here is to understand the importance of key philosophical distinctions for maintaining a consistent principle of the sanctity of life. I want to begin uh, with a quote from a fairly extensive quote from a gentleman by the name of Daniel Callahan. Daniel Callahan, as some of you may know, was the former president of the uh, Hastings Center, and now he's an emeritus scholar. But in a recent discussion paper, uh, these are some words that he uh, penned here, reflecting on this whole notion of medicalized dying and the context of American health care. He writes, the American public must recognize some hard truths about, uh, excuse me, most of which reflect some deep values of our kind of medicine and culture. The most important is that American medicine since the end of World War II has in effect declared a war on death, an unlimited pursuit of medical progress. To pursue that goal, it has supported medical research to seek a cure for all of the killer diseases, notably cancer, heart disease, stroke, kidney failure, and diabetes. The public <clears throat> polls have shown over the years fully supports that effort. The media have pitched in reporting and touting the great promise and breakthroughs of the medical crusade. We now live some eight years longer on average than we did 40 years ago. Death rates are declining for many diseases and new technologies to keep us alive longer continue to flow forth. On the surface, those developments look good, but that story has taken an unexpected turn. The idea of unlimited medical progress that emits of no upper boundaries is not turning out as hoped. We have not found, nor are we anywhere near finding, cures for the major killer diseases. What progress has given us is an enhanced ability to keep sick people alive at a high cost financially and no less high cost in terms of pain and suffering at the end of life, he writes. 
Now he goes on to say at the end of his particular column, more and more of our end-of-life care looks like the trench warfare of World War I, heavier and heavier economic and human costs with increasingly less ground being won. Another feature, he says, of the quest for unlimited progress is that technological advances have made it harder and harder to determine with any precision when a patient is actually dying. There is almost always something that can be done technologically to give a dying person a few more hours or days or even weeks before he actually dies. Now, this is the picture as Callahan paints it, as he uh, understands it in many, uh, in many ways. This is the state of affairs. And other people would agree with him. Now, perhaps we could quibble here and there that some of his statements may be a bit overstated. Uh, even so, I'm inclined to think that they are not overstated by too much. Whatever our assessment of this description is, uh, description of, of that Del, uh, Callahan gives, it is certainly true, I want to suggest, that we need to think carefully. I think especially Americans need to think carefully about care at the end of life. Further, given our context here, in a setting like Gordon College, Christian ethics also demands that we care for the dying, and we should value human life regardless of the condition of the person. This is something that is very, very important and near to the uh, heart of Christian ethics, that all human beings have value. <clears throat> so here's a question, probably the question that we need to wrestle with on this uh, afternoon. What does it mean to value life at the end of life? What does it mean to value life at the end of life? Uh, following John Keon of Georgetown University, the Kennedy Institute, I want to highlight three schools of thought to, um, or three options here about what it means to value life uh, at the end of life. The first is going to be this notion of medical vitalism. Second, the notion of quality of life. And third is going to be the sanctity or the inviolability of life. Okay, so medical vitalism. Uh, the quality of life, and the sanctity, or some would say the inviolability of life. So these are three primary or major schools of thought by which people have determined uh, or at least understood how life should be valued or what gives uh, life worth in some way or other. So let's begin with the first one here, this notion of medical <clears throat> vitalism, medical vitalism. This view basically holds that human life is an absolute moral value. Because of its absolute worth, it is wrong to either shorten the life of a patient or to fail to strive to lengthen it, whether the life be that of a seriously disabled newborn baby or an elderly woman with advanced dementia. Vitalism prohibits its shortening and requires its preservation. Regardless of the pain, suffering, or expense that life-prolonging treatment entails, it must be administered, according to this particular view. So it requires human life to be preserved at all costs. Now, uh, I actually want to suggest that vitalism is often thought to be what is either meant or entailed by the notion of the sanctity or the inviolability of life. Uh, as I have interacted with people, uh, sometimes religious believers from various faith traditions, when they talk about the sanctity or the inviolability of life, when they describe it, uh, many times they're describing what I want to say is uh, vitalism in some ways. <clears throat> now, many of the critics of the sanctity of life view, as well as those who endorse it, have uh, found it interesting to equate the description of vitalism here with this idea of the sanctity and inviolability of life for whatever reason. Uh, but I do think that this is a mistake. As I hope to make clear, I don't think this approach to valuing life best fits with a consistent Christian ethic, or perhaps we could say a theologically informed Christian ethic. And this is what I hope to show a bit later. <clears throat> At the other extreme is the notion of the quality of life, okay, the quality of life. Now, this is going to be important for us to think about because this phrase does show up quite a bit in the medical context. And I want to say, just already tipping my hand as a precursor, we'll say it again a little bit later, uh, that we need to make sure we understand this carefully because this language does show up quite a bit in medical context. And I think there's a right use of this kind of language as well, but also perhaps a more problematic use. And so when we talk about quality of life here, I want you to just make sure that you distinguish here between big Q, um, quality of life, and we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, kind of little Q, 
uh, quality of life. But here, this is this notion of kind of big Q um, <clears throat> quality of life. And basically, this view uh, says that life is not concerned, uh, or that the value of life is not only with assessing the worthwhileness of the treatment, okay, but also the worthwhileness of the patient's life. Note that language there. Not only deals with the worthwhileness of the treatment, but the worthwhileness of the patient's life. It holds that the lives of certain patients fall below a quality threshold, whether because of disease, injury, or disability, okay? Now, this evaluation of human life grounds the principle that because certain lives are not worth living, it is not wrong intentionally to end them, whether by act or by deliberate omission. Some who subscribe to this doctrine would require that the patient's request, uh, that would require the patient's request as a precondition of termination on the ground that only the patient is in a position to judge whether life is still worth living and others would disagree who hold a quality of life to say that the, um, the consent of the patient is not required. And the reason why they could say something like that, that maybe we don't always need consent to be required because if someone lost capacity to interact with um, other people and if their quality of life has deteriorated so low uh, that that life is not of value anymore and that person is not really part of our moral community uh, any longer, at least the way some people would flesh this out in some ways, such that consent would not necessarily be needed uh, with respect to this uh, particular view here. So again, the emphasis um, with big Q, quality of life, is not looking at so much the worthwhileness of the treatment, but it's gonna primarily focus on the worthwhileness of the uh, patient or the value of the patient's life in the debilitated condition. <clears throat> now, I don't think that this view ultimately accords with the particular approach to Christian ethics that I and many others want to uh, develop. Human beings are said to be made in the image of God according to uh, certain theological themes and biblical narratives. Uh, there is debate as to exactly what the image of God consists in and of. But one implication that clearly flows from this teaching is that human beings are valuable in virtue of their humanity, okay? Their lives as human beings are not any less valuable simply because they may have some sort of disease, injury, or disability, okay? So this seems to be a key principle that's developed in a Christian approach to ethics such that if this quality of life view uh, as it describes the value of human persons stands, it seems to be in a bit of a conflict with a foundational principle uh, that is used in developing Christian ethics. <clears throat> now, between these views, uh, now again, um, <laughs> sometimes we think, you know, you have the extremes and always it's better to land in the middle. Uh, that's not true, obviously. Uh, there are some things we should not land on the middle of. Uh, we think about things of child abuse, right? We don't want really middle positions on that uh, in many ways. Uh, but I do think that vitalism on one end is a bit extreme. Uh, it doesn't take into consideration certain uh, real facts that we have to wrestle with and deal with as being finite creatures. Quality of life, in my opinion, seems, or at least big Q, quality of life seems to, to rub up against uh, the side of, of, of a Christian ethic or the heart of a principled Christian ethics with respect to the value of human life being rooted in the image of God. Uh, so we have this other view called the sanctity or the inviolability view, okay? <clears throat> now, this view certainly has religious connotations, obviously. Sometimes people use the term the sacredness of life. Uh, I don't prefer that term as much because it tends to be misunderstood. Uh, the sanctity of life also uh, could be just as misunderstood in many ways. Uh, so it certainly has religious uh, connotations and development, and many religious ethicists have made appeal to this notion in developing their ethical systems. Uh, but also it's interesting that this principle has been developed by uh, certain secular approaches or non-religious approaches uh, to ethics, and they use the word inviolability, okay, inviolability. Uh, again, some individuals want to stay away from the term sanctity or sacredness because it has, is too close to notions of divinity or deity in some ways, but inviolability, they think, is what uh, really is, is getting at the heart of this particular issue. Now, according to the principle of the sanctity of life understood here or the inviolability of life, 
Human life possesses intrinsic dignity, and one must never intentionally kill a human being without significant moral justification. Okay? Life possesses intrinsic dignity, or human life possesses intrinsic dignity, and one must never intentionally kill a human being without significant moral justification. Specifically, as it plays out in a medical context, this valuation of human life holds that uh, human life is inherently valuable as a basic good. Okay, note that language there, that those who try to develop a a robust view of the inviolability of life and the sanctity of life affirm that human life, yes, is inherently valuable as a basic good and must never be taken intentionally, but it need not be preserved at all cost. Okay? <clears throat> it need not be preserved at all costs. Now, this notion of a, of a basic good here is very, very important, right? Uh, because some people have described uh, the value of human life as kind of like an ultimate good or the ultimate good. I think we have to be very careful about that language because when we get into that language, that is language that, theologically speaking, is properly reserved for maybe God or the beatific vision and things along that line or visions of the new heavens and new earth. Uh, but at least this side of those kinds of events and things that um, are to take place, that we must affirm, I think, that human life is valuable as a basic good and must never be taken intentionally here. <clears throat> now, my view is, uh, there would probably be no surprise to you here at this point, uh, that I think this view of valuing human life, the sanctity and viability of life doctrine, is the most consistent with the theologically informed Christian ethic. Uh, and furthermore, I want to also say that given the fact that it, you're really living be- uh, between two poles, if you will, or two guardrails, it takes wisdom in order to, to live out this particular ethic or apply it in uh, real-life situations that confront us or confront our communities in uh, many ways. And so one of the things that we'll come back to at the end is the importance of thinking about a wisdom uh, ethic. Uh, and, of course, we can't live our lives with the kind of complexities that we find ourselves in without developing the kind of wisdom that comes from being part of a Christian community, meditating on Scripture and communing with the Holy Spirit and gathering together in worship of the true and living God. At least that's the way that I see uh, Christian ethics, uh, developing a wisdom ethic. Uh, my colleague, David Gill, who's here, he often says that uh, Christian ethics is uh, not an uh, individual sport, but it's a team sport, and we do it in community. <clears throat> now, I want to take a few minutes to give an exposition of the principle of the sanctity or inviolability of life here. Uh, I want to approach this second objective that I stated that we'll talk about this afternoon by first looking at some theological resources that actually inform many theological ethicists and Christian moral philosophers. Uh, These, I want to say, theological um, resources um, actually are important, right, for helping kind of navigate or at least guide what it means to value life at the end of life. Uh, when you're trying to engage in, let's say, theological ethics. And the second thing I want to do in terms of trying to give an exposition of this principle of the sanctity of life and begin to kind of intimate how it can be applied um, is by looking at certain philosophical distinctions uh, for the claim uh, of consistency, okay? For the claim of consistency. Many individuals have really pushed back on the notion of the sanctity of life, as I've tried to describe it here, uh, that life is a basic good, and uh, with intrinsic value, uh, so well, not only instrumental value, but also intrinsic value, life, human life should not be uh, intentionally taken without sufficient moral justification, but yet it should not be preserved at all costs. Many people push back on that and say, well, this is uh, somewhat inconsistent. Uh, it's inconsistently applied because you slip into using quality of life language when determining whether or not you should continue with fuel treatment, Uh, Others would say, well, some of the distinctions that you rest the moral significance on uh, from, you know, um, consequences that are foreseen versus those that are intended don't really hold. Uh, So it's very important to look at some of these issues and to make sure that we're clear on those and at least understand what a defense of these kinds of things, uh, cognitively speaking or conceptually speaking, will look like in order to maintain some consistency that will help us in ethical decision-making with respect to uh, end-of-life ethical issues here. 
So let's just begin here with the, uh, some theological resources. Um, <clears throat> I want to identify three broad theological claims that help serve as guidelines and boundary markers for our work in end-of-life ethics or in issues of death and dying. The first one is going, uh, the first is that we must affirm that death is a foe or an enemy, which is true, but it is a defeated foe, okay? So yes, theologically speaking, death is an enemy, um, but it is a defeated enemy. As uh, John Jefferson Davis, the theologian Christian ethics, uh, ethicist at uh, Gordon-Conwell notes, the biblical teaching sees death as unnatural, inevitable, and for the Christian, not ultimately final. The biblical narrative does give us a picture where we see death as a foe or as an enemy. Uh, death, in some ways, is an unnatural intrusion into God's world, and many passages bear this out. Uh, for example, Genesis 2.17 reads, When you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. Or Paul's teaching in Romans 5.12, where he uh, makes a connection between the sin of the man, or Adam, and human death. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, and so on and so forth. Okay? Now, it is not relevant, I think, for my purposes here uh, to take a position on the theological debate as to whether or not there was some sort of death before sin entered in the world, or whether the entrance of sin just simply changed the nature of death that was already here in some form. Regardless of the judgment one makes on these matters, what must be acknowledged for biblically faithful Christians, I want to say, is that there is a linkage between sin and death, that we see that clearly in the biblical narrative. Whatever the broader theological debates say, there is this link between sin and death. And so in light of this teaching, this side of the new heavens and new earth, death is inevitable, okay? Death is inevitable. There is a time to be born, and there is a time to die, according to the preacher or the teacher in Ecclesiastes 3, 2. Also, for the Christian, death is not final, okay? 1 Corinthians 15, 21, Paul says, For as by a man came death, by a man is also came the resurrection of the dead. And this, as we know, is the great hope of the Christian. The last enemy, which is death, is swallowed up in life, or so the biblical language uh, speaks. So for the Christian, death is not final. <clears throat> and if we were in church, I would assume that I would hear some amens, right? Or at least in the church context where I, where I uh, go, uh, when you think about the great Christian hope that we have, the joy uh, of the resurrection, uh, it does give us uh, a cause to, to celebrate and to exclaim with joy. Now, the uh, practical import here with respect to this particular theological theme that is very important in terms of helping us develop some guardrails to think about issues at the end of life is that uh, we can see that a pure vitalism, as described uh, earlier, is to be rejected. The Christian hope longs for the glorified body, 1 Corinthians 15, to embrace this life as the highest or ultimate good, uh, as something to be hung on to at all costs, can very easily, if we're not careful, slide into a form of idolatry. That we've placed this life uh, before uh, the wonderful beatific vision of, of God, as some theologians have uh, cashed out the notion. <clears throat> the second theological resource I think we have for thinking about this issue uh, is that <clears throat> Uh, following here, uh, Dennis Hollinger, who's president of Sem uh, Gordon-Conwell Seminary and also a Christian ethicist, uh, he identifies the fact that suffering is a challenge to persevere and an opportunity to overcome. That suffering is a challenge to persevere in, I should say, and an opportunity to overcome. On one hand, the Bible does speak of suffering as producing something of value in the lives of human beings. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. Not only that, Paul says, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now I want to say, as one who does work in, in hospice, uh, that this uh, notion of, uh, of suffering, or some would say redemptive suffering, should be an excuse to not do all that we can within ethical parameters to help with suffering that comes from physical pain and disease. I think the point with respect to the biblical teaching is that when we suffer, uh, 
we are to do so with the hope that comes with having the joy of the Lord. So in many ways, it's not our role or responsibility to tell someone else who's in the throes of pain and suffering, oh, well, your suffering is redemptive, right? That's cruel, callous, and uh, if the person has the ability, they may throw something at you, right? But nevertheless, from a Christian perspective, at least from a Christian ethical perspective, we do know that uh, this notion of suffering is something to persevere uh, in in some way or other. Now, this... <clears throat> Uh, so th I think we see uh, also on the other side of this that the healing ministry of Jesus, uh, beyond identifying him as the divine son of God, um, who also as a clear expression of mercy, love, and compassion, uh, he healed people of physical pain, illness, and disease, right? This was an expression of mercy, love, and compassion. So even the healing ministry of Jesus, he sought uh, to alleviate pain and suffering. And so... These, this issue certainly gives us an opportunity to overcome. And so, again, there are the parameters that we, uh, in terms of practical import, that this second theological point helps us to identify the balance between two extremes. The first extreme is to think of suffering as an unqualified evil that must be eradicated at all costs, even if that means employing euthanasia, <clears throat> some would say, or at least some have argued, to alleviate the suffering. The other extreme is a too rigid acceptance of suffering that leads to unnecessarily prolonging death and the experience of suffering. Okay? So again, two poles, two extremes that one has to navigate between. This tension is certainly consistent with the primary claim behind the sanctity of life principle. I hope you're able to connect the dots here which holds that human life is inherently valuable as a basic good and must never be taken intentionally, but it need not be preserved at all cost in the face of death. And the third theological resource, I think, that can be identified here um, that can help us is that we live in the tension of divine providence and human stewardship. We live in the tension of divine providence and human stewardship. Scripture, I think, is clear that God is always preserving and guiding the created order to its end and fulfillment. In a real sense, we can say that God is in control, though in, the, though in an equally real sense, we can say that human beings make real decisions and have uh, been given faculties not only to make decisions, but also a mandate to steward the resources of the earth for the common good. So medicine and science and uh, technology um, and all of those uh, objects' proper use is just one such expression of what it means to be in the image of God. In other words, to image God. Okay? This is very, very important as we fulfill the cultural mandate. So we've been, we're stewards. Some would go as far as to say co-creators uh, in some ways to harness the earth's resources uh, to develop and extend and go further and beyond. And medicine, science, and technology is, I want to say, just one um, extension or fulfillment of what it means to image God or to be image bearers of God. <clears throat> and so we live in this tension of divine providence. Yes, these things, life and death, are ultimately in the hands of God, right? Scripture affirms that in many ways. But we also notice that we make decisions that do affect our lives that can even possibly affect the timing of our death in many ways, okay? Uh, Robert Orr, a uh, medical doctor who used to be at uh, Loma Linda uh, years ago, a uh, Christian physician, medical ethicist. Um, he writes this in a, a recent essay. He says, dying is a process. Sometimes this process happens quickly, but more often in today's era of intensive medical care, dying happens slowly. When we consider the use of ventilator support to help a person breathe, dialysis to replace felt kidneys, transfusion to replace blood loss, antibiotics to replace infectious, uh, infections, CPR to try to reverse cardiac arrest, we see that the timing of death can involve an element of choice. Whether the patient dies in a few minutes or a few hours or a few days or a few weeks is often determined by a choice about whether to start, continue, or stop one or more of these treatments. Reality is, is that we have to make decisions especially at the end of life. We can't get caught up in the paralysis of analysis because the uh, decisions are often forced upon us in many ways. This is one of the reasons why I uh, try not to use and kind of push back a little bit often when 
uh, Christians are engaging in this conversation about, you know, they are talking about certain, let's say, um, uh, decisions being wrong as playing God, right? Uh, because it's taking life and death into our hands. Now, I think there's a sense in which we can play God when we try to cross a line that is clearly only in the providence uh, uh, or the domain of, of God's uh, sphere of influence in many ways. But I do think we have to be careful because the reality is that we do make decisions. And so these are some very broad theological points that inform our discussion, I want to say. And I hope enough has been said to see the compatibly, compatibility of the sanctity of life principle articulated here with a theologically informed Christian ethic. <clears throat> now, um, some important characteristics of the sanctity of life. Um, at this point, we need to move to our third objective and highlight some key distinctions that are crucial in maintaining a, philosophy, a philosophically consistent principle of the sanctity of life as it applies specifically to end-of-life medical ethics in light of some potential objections to it. Now, I want to be careful here because this is probably going to, uh, in some ways, one of the most conceptually difficult areas of dealing with these kinds of issues. Uh, and I'll try not to go too deep into some of these matters, and perhaps in the Q&A or interaction, we can flesh some of these points out. And there are some objections here that I'm anticipating that maybe not... Uh, stating directly, and again, if you want to kind of tease some of those out, we can certainly do that uh, when we have time to interact and discuss uh, some of these matters um, together here. <clears throat> but the primary question here uh, that we have uh, that I want to explore is, does the sanctity of life principle require vitalism? Okay? Does the sanctity of life principle require vitalism? Now, it's interesting because you say, well, Smith, you, you gave these extremes that you have, you know, medical vitalism on one hand, big Q, quality of life on the other, in the middle of the sanctity of life of you. And then you come back and ask this question, does the sanctity of life of you lead to medical vitalism despite its claims uh, not to? And this is kind of an objection that other people are making. They're saying, but wait a minute, if you reject, let's say, quality of life kinds of distinctions, as I mentioned before, Bit, you seem to appeal to some of those to whether or not you determine to discontinue, let's say, life-sustaining treatment in some ways. And then some would say it's not clear to me uh, that uh, when you cease doing certain kinds of things that you're not intentionally killing uh, a person uh, who otherwise would have continued to live uh, with respect to certain kinds of treatment. So I think this is a thorny issue that has to be uh, fleshed out and teased out. I think many philosophers uh, and theologians and Christian ethicists or ethicists of any stripe have done so. I think there's both uh, good work being done on both sides of the issue, even though uh, people on either side of the issue may not want to acknowledge that there's some good work and some good points being made on both sides uh, concerning these very complex matters here. But the first distinction I want to highlight for us is this uh, distinction uh, that I think we must maintain and also work hard to defend the distinction between intended consequences of an action and consequences that are merely foreseen, okay? Uh, intended consequences of an action and consequences that are merely foreseen. There's ongoing work that needs to be done here. Uh, Daniel P. Somacy of University of Chicago, again, another medical doctor and uh, an ethicist uh, as well, you know, he just says, he kind of trumpets the call uh, that, you know, every generation has to go back and review and to try to defend these uh, principles and develop the conceptual tools and resources that best capture our intuitions on these matters here. Uh, the sanctity or inviolability of life holds that intentional taking of human life, whether done by act or omission, okay, regardless of the motive or the reason, is morally wrong. As John Keown notes, the sanctity of life accepts that conduct which foreseeably shortens life is not always wrong, okay? That foreseeably shortens life. So that there are instances in which life-sustaining treatments are stopped with no intention of ending the life of the patient, though death may be a foreseen consequence of the action. So one is not morally culpable for the death, and the choice to cease life-sustaining treatments should be seen um, not as killing, but as allowing uh, the patient to die, okay? Uh, now, this is very important, uh, that it should not be seen as killing, but allowing the patient to die. Now, I want to be very, very clear that the point that I'm making uh, for those who may be informed of this discussion here is not what's called a bare difference argument. 
that killing is always morally wrong and allowing to die is always morally right. Some people make that distinction. Killing, wrong, allowing to die, morally right. Uh, that, and some people call that the bare difference argument. Uh, I want to say that that's faulty, uh, and we need to be very careful about making that kind of distinction and ascribing uh, moral value uh, to say that um, if it's ki- instance of killing, it's always wrong, allowing to die, it's always right. Because we can think of many, many counterexamples, right? Where there may be, even though controversial, it may be instances of, of killing someone who's an aggressor in some way, let's say, with respect to self-defense. So it's not clear that every instance of killing is always morally wrong, although we would presume that most are, and also allowing to die. Uh, let's say if a um, um, surgeon or somebody in an emergency room has an obligation to treat uh, a patient who comes in, they see a person who's laying on the stretcher, you know, owes them uh, a large sum of money, and so they decide, you know, oh, I'm just going to allow the person to die from their wounds, right? I haven't killed them. I haven't done anything, right? I've just simply allowed them to die. Um, well, that's problematic, right? We want to say at the end of the day that that person is morally culpable, right, for the, action, the inaction uh, in that particular circumstance or situation. So any of these moral valuations are always going to be contextual, right, that you have to look at the context and other kinds of properties to be able to determine whether or not there's moral culpability that has taken place here. Um, many have suggested that this uh, is a conceptually untenable and morally irrelevant distinction, yet it is going to be uh, central to a consistent application of the sanctity of life principle, at least the way I am conceiving of it uh, here in this context. Uh, I do think the basic notion of the distinction and the centrality of intention in moral assessment can be captured intuitively in our reflections on particular cases, even if all of the complex issues in what some people call in philosophy of action theory are not fully resolved, okay? Now, again, I'm gonna share with you a couple of, you know, thought experiment, well, maybe one thought experiment that can help flesh out how intentions actually matter in moral assessment. And I want to, again, be very clear that thought experiments can't do all the philosophical work for us, right? What the thought experiments do are to flesh out what we what seems to be the case, and then we still have to do the hard work of trying to articulate and argue why what we think is the correct way of proceeding in this actually is the correct way of proceeding. But just for the sake of time here and for the point of the exercise, uh, I won't try to flesh out, uh, nor do I have time or perhaps the expertise to flesh out all the issues that would uh, come along with um, action theory here. But let's just take the example of a case presented by an ethicist who asks us to consider the actions of two dentists, okay? The kindly Dr. Phil and the cruel Mr. Drill, okay? So kindly, the kind doctor, Dr. Phil, okay? Uh, F-I-L-L, not P-H-I-L, right? So, you know, since uh, this was written, I think Dr. Phil has, uh, you know, burst on the scene, so I have to clarify now. But Dr. Phil, F-I-L-L, and then the cruel Dr. Drill, D-R-I-L-L. <clears throat> All right, so this is how uh, the story goes. Dr. Phil drills out decay in your tooth and fills the cavity in accordance with good dental practice. Even though both you and Dr. Phil foresee that you will suffer from pain, you know, just for the sake of the thought experiment, you know, the extreme anesthetics and anesthesia is out right now. So uh, it's probably hard to conceive of the thought experiment now given with certain advances. But nevertheless, you can use your imagination here. Uh, Dr. Phil foresee, you and Dr. Phil foresee that you will suffer from pain. The following week, Dr. Drill drills out decay in another of your teeth and fills the cavity. But whereas Dr. Phil merely foresaw that you would inevitably suffer pain, Dr. Drill intends you to suffer pain. Clearly, whereas Dr. Phil has done nothing morally questionable, Dr. Drill has. And the reason is solely to be found in Dr. Drill's intending the bad consequence rather than simply foreseeing it as an inevitable side effect of the good consequence, namely repairing your tooth. Now, this is irrespective of the fact that the bad consequence, the pain, is precisely the same in both cases, right? So at least on the kind of ethical theory that, I'm, uh, that I think is consistent with theological ethics is that we have to look beyond just the mere consequences of an action or an event to determine its moral assessment, that there are other factors that 
uh, go into us determining or making uh, value judgments. To reiterate, even though the actions are outwardly identical, they are morally distinct. It seems clear that the difference in the intentional states of mind of Dr. Phil and Dr. Drill is significant in evaluating the moral nature of their actions. Okay? And I just want to uh, share with you a particular quote by Margaret Somerville in her book, The Ethical Canary, because I think she does a good job of, of uh, showing some of these distinctions with various issues that emerge in end-of-life contexts. So she writes, refusals of treatment, including uh, that of life support treatment and artificial hydration and nutrition, and the provision of necessary pain relief treatment or treatments for other symptoms of serious physical distress are not euthanasia, even if these actions shorten life. In respecting refusals of treatment, the primary intention is to respect the person's right to inviolability, the right not to be touched, including by treatment without one's consent. In giving pain relief treatment, the primary intention is to relieve pain, not to inflict death. In euthanasia, the primary intention is to inflict death in order to relieve pain and suffering. It is this primary intention that makes euthanasia unacceptable to those who oppose it. And I want to say unacceptable to those who embrace the sanctity of life principle as it's being developed, unless they articulate it uh, here. Okay. Um, quickly here, distinction number two, um, and the last distinction here. Um, I think it's important to uh, think about the worthwhileness of treatment versus the worthwhileness of the patient. Uh, and this is where what would be considered little Q quality of life considerations become important, okay? Little Q uh, quality of life. There is an important distinction to be had between the worthwhileness of treatments versus the worth worthwhileness of the patient, okay? <clears throat> For the sake of time, I think it's best to flesh this out by quoting uh, John Keown again um, in one of his, I think, uh, a very good book that he wrote in dealing with a number of these topics here. <clears throat> he says, a treatment may not be worthwhile either because it offers no reasonable hope of benefit or because, even though it does, uh, the expected benefit would be outweighed by burdens which the treatment would impose, such as excessive pain. Notice, however, that the question is always whether the treatment would be worthwhile, not whether the patient's life would be worthwhile. That's a very important point, uh, point here. That is always a, a value judgment about the treatment would be worthwhile, not whether the patient's life would be worthwhile. Were one to engage in judgments of the latter sort and to conclude that certain lives were not worth living, one would forfeit any principal basis for objection to intentional killing. Okay. <clears throat> It is within these parameters, I want to say, that it is appropriate to employ what are called qualified quality of life language, okay? Uh, I think we can employ qualified quality of life language. This could be considered the distinction between big Q, quality of life, uh, with little Q, quality of life considerations that focus on the benefit or the burdens of a given treatment. So often in a medical context, many who hold to the viability of life do make appeal to quality of life considerations, but the quality of life considerations are aimed not at the person, but the treatment. Again, I want to go back to Keown here uh, when he says, quality of life judgments purport to, big Q, quality of life judgments, purport to judge the worthwhileness of the patient's life. The inviolability doctrine opposes such attempts and merely takes the patient's condition into account in deciding on the worthwhileness of a proposed treatment. For in order to decide whether a proposed treatment would be worthwhile, one must first ascertain the patient's present condition and consider whether and to what extent it would be improved by the proposed treatment. The exercise is often described as involving an assessment of the patient's, what I would call little q, quality of life now and as it would be after the treatment. Okay? So I think this is an important point. So when quality of life language, quality of life language does emerge uh, in a medical context, if this is what is being understood, I think this is less problematic, ethically speaking, uh, if the big Q quality of life, making a, a judgment about the value of that person's life regards to the condition, uh, that's going to be, uh, at least on the terms being considered here, more problematic here. <clears throat> So basic question here, um, <clears throat> does the sanctity of life view lead to medical vitalism despite its claim not to? 
Uh, basically, I want to say uh, that when properly understood, I think the answer is that it does not, okay? Now, again, there's a lot of debate, pushback that goes on uh, with respect to some of these issues, uh, and there's much more uh, that could be said. But I think what we really need in this situation is a biblically faithful wisdom ethic, okay? A biblically faithful wisdom ethic. Uh, we do have certain parameters of thinking about these issues, um, <clears throat> uh, theologically speaking, but it's not always clear what the right thing to do uh, in any given situation may or may not be. Oftentimes, there are a range of morally permissible options that we can appeal to. I uh, like the way Dennis Hollinger, uh, in his book, Choosing the Good, he describes this complexity here. And this is what he says. Because issues can be complex, some of our decisions may involve choosing the wise course of action rather than the absolute moral good. This is certainly not always the case, for even in the midst of complexity, we are often able to discern clear directions. However, we must be open to the fact that in regard to some ethical judgments, our focus will be more on the wise, judicious course of action than on one absolute right course of action. Um, I love the way that... Um, Dr. Robert Fine, who's uh, clinical director of palliative care uh, down at uh, Baylor, um, Baylor College of Health, uh, Baylor Healthcare System, uh, this is what he says in response to this notion of medicalized dying that we started with, and I'll close with this. But even uh, greater improvement is possible when we all accept that sooner or later, mortality is not a medical problem to be solved, but a spiritual problem to be faced. When we learn to number our days spiritually, then we may gain the psalmist's heart of wisdom. A physician with such a heart may better distinguish between treatments that prolong dying versus those that restore health. A patient with a heart of wisdom may, be, may better accept a lesson from Ecclesiastes that there is a time to stop running from death. Finally, family who have gained a heart of wisdom may be better uh, able to accept that loving enough to let go is the highest love they can bestow on the dying. And I want to say that this wisdom that Robert Fine talks about, at least in a Christian context, is only made possible by the gospel. That when we've been touched in many ways by the gospel, we see things in a very different light. When we've been touched by the gospel, we can see the wisdom in not holding on to the things of this world so tightly, even our human physical existence. Because of the gospel and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, we have a hope a hope that transcends this world, a hope that transcends this understanding. So what does it mean to value life at the end of life? Well, I just simply want to say that it means to know God and know the great hope that we have that is in the very gospel of Jesus Christ itself. Now, that may not be very comforting to those who don't know Christ, but at least to the community of believers, it should give us uh, a sense of peace as we face difficult days ahead. <clears throat> so I will close with that. And... Um, I'm not sure how much time we have, so I'm so sorry I went long. <laughs>